This is joint paper with Vanessa Hill, who, as Richard said, can't be here and would have otherwise presented. Um, it's called Mathematical Representation of the Genetic Code, and this is based on work done over a long period between us. This is just another development in this long period of work. So we've used quite a few mathematical structures, algebra and geometry, and algebra connected with geometry, and they include a 64-part vector quaternion algebra, which I'll show you in a moment, because that's what I'm going to use here. This algebra is isomorphic to the gamma algebra of the Dirac equation. And also, combination of the faces and vertices of regular icosidodecahedron can also be used. They're, they're closely related. It's the same mathematics. One's algebra, the other's geometry. And we want to show that you can actually represent the codon structures, the 64 codons of the genetic code, in a way, both algebraically and geometry, in order that we can see how the, begin to understand how the code for amino acids. So, so to make that manageable and useful. So this is the vector quaternion algebra. This is the basis of it. And this is multivariate vectors, Clifford algebra vectors, quaternion-like vectors, if you like. So these vectors have a real product, a full product. They're, pro they're a proper algebra, not the ordinary vector algebra, which isn't a proper algebra, because it doesn't have a product. But this has a product. It's been around for a long while. Um, so Clifford algebra, three-dimensional space, I, J, K, vectors. But I, I, I would always call it vector algebra. And a pseudo-scalar algebra, which is that. That goes with that. And this is the quaternion algebra with the one to make up the real part of the quaternion. The quaternions being square root of minus one, dimensional square root of minus one. I'll, I'll say more about these algebras when I do my own presentation this afternoon. And the reason why we're using those is because physically, if one's doing physics, that in my own way of thinking, that the first one represents space, that represents time, that re represents charge, and that represents mass or mass energy. And these are the fundamental parameters of physics. So that all the fundamental parameters can be represented within this algebra. And another way you can, I'll, I'll go back to that for a moment, another way you can consider it is that there are two spaces. So this is one space, and this is the other space. And this isn't quite full vector. To make it a vector, you just multiply it by that pseudo-scalar, that I term there, which will make this a vector. So all this put together is equivalent to another space equivalent to that one. Two commutative spaces. And essentially, you can do physics or, and anything else on that basis. So the idea is that natural systems can always be represented as a double space, and there's nothing else you need, only that. And it's like a space and an anti-space, if you like. But it's like two spaces. That's all you need to represent any natural system. And it doesn't have to be physics. It could be biology or chemistry. Ultimately, that's what you do. And I'll say more about that later. But on this, in this presentation, I'm not going to say too much about it. So these are two uni the units of two spaces, the blue one and the red one. And the, the, the blue one is like what we might call ordinary space, real space. The red one is everything else, vacuum. So in principle, any self-organizing system, doesn't matter what it is, physical, biological, chemical, mental, anything you want, any self-organizing system forms a space. And in, in addition to the ordinary space, there's a distorted mirror image of another space, which is like a kind of anti-space to it, which represents the rest of the universe. So each system sees in itself its image but distorted and that's the rest of the universe. And that's how the rest of the universe and the system interact. So when we say self-organizing, it's not quite self-organizing because it's also mutually being organized by the rest of the universe and organizing it. So the double space create, creates a combination of system and vacuum as a zero totality. Now the system could be a fermion, an ordinary elementary particle. And the way that behaves is all its interactions and everything 
are determined by the rest of the universe and itself mutually. And so it sees itself as a mirror image in the rest of the universe. This, the, the algebra that does this, this is the full algebra. If I take those units I started out with, and keep multiplying them until we've done every possible multiplication of those eight units there, I will end up getting that algebra. That's 64 units of that algebra. So plus and minus versions are then all these things here. The red ones being the quaternion units, the blue ones being the vector units, and the, these black I ones being the pseudo-scalar units. So that's the complete algebra, the complete system. And this is the algebra of the Dirac equation. It's the algebra of the fermion state. It's exactly the same as the gamma algebra of the, of the Dirac state, just represented in an algebraic way instead of those matrices. No difference whatsoever. All the same properties. And we could order this in different ways. We could, we could actually construct that table in many different ways. And they, they each tell you a different story. But what we, one, one of the ways that we're particularly interested in is to separate the four complex numbers from 12 nilpotent structures. And I'll show you that in a moment. So th this is what I mean. Here, the, this, we've got the, the four ordinary um, complex numbers. Remove those, and then the rest form themselves into groups of five like this. And you see there are 12 groups of these five. Now, if you look at those, each one of these is a generator for this algebra. This is a group of order 64, and any of those five can generate the entire algebra. So if I just take one of these five and multiply it all out, I'll get the whole algebra. And those aren't the only five you could have. There are many, many others, but they're all based on that pattern. They all have that structure. And why I said one space was distorted is because you can see, if you look at this, that the, the red space here, the red one here, um, let's look at this one instead, I'd rather look at this one. This space here, ijk, that's, that's connected to the same operator, so that's not distorted. But this one here, when you take the red ones, you can see they're connected to different operators. That's i, that's 1, and these are i, j, and k. So the red space is distorted and the blue one isn't when you look at that. So if I take those five units and multiply them until you know, I've done every conceivable multiplication, I'll get the whole algebra, They're the generators of the group. And there are many ways of getting those generators. Now, when you look at, you, you realize when, you, when you're doing the, the it's, uh, for a fermion, a particle, that this really is the, this really becomes the um, energy, op oh, sorry, this one becomes the energy operator. This one, the the mass operator, and this one the momentum operator. And so if you put those together, you put values for the energy, momentum, and mass in, then you get the whole thing will square to zero, and that's what we mean by nil potent. So if it multiplies itself by its distorted mirror image, it zeroes. That's what I mean by zero totality, absolutely nothing at all. What do you mean by distorted? I mean that we can't see it the way it really is. The way we see it, it looks distorted. But in, in truth, it isn't, of course, from its own perspective, from our perspective, that it looks distorted. I mean, it's distorted here because these red ones here are, are different when they should be identical. That This K is operating on something different to that J and that I. And in, in, if it were not distorted, it would look exactly the same. So the way we package it looks distorted, but in, in, in itself it wouldn't. If you looked at it from its perspective, it wouldn't be distorted. So the whole idea is that this tells you what a fundamental particle, what's packaged into a fundamental particle when we create it. What's packaged into the universe that that fundamental particle sees. So this is what this algebra tells us. But it's not only what's packaged into a fundamental particle, it's what's packaged into any self-organizing system. It has to look something like that. And the genetic code is another self-organizing system. There are many uh, things that you could apply this kind of mathematical structure to. So 
Here I uh, summarise what I've said. The 64 uh, units form an algebraic group. The group can be produced from a set of just five generators. And by the way, five is where you break symmetry. Anything that's five will always break symmetry. That's why you get distortion. Six wouldn't break symmetry. We could have three blue ones and three red ones, all perfectly symmetric. But five, which is the lower order, breaks symmetry. It's a bit like the Higgs mechanism. The lower order is less symmetric than the, than the upper order. <laughs> that sort of thing. <coughs> and that's a typical set of generators. And so, if we take the original eight algebraic units we use for time, space, mass, charge, put them together, and to get the minimal structure we need, which is only five units, then we have to distort the symmetry of one. And it's this red one that we do in this case. So we distort one space, the red one, not the observed space, the space we don't observe, and we leave the blue one alone, the observed space. So our two spaces, one of them is distorted. And as I say, mathematically, we can associate that with the energy, this with the momentum, and this with the mass. And if I put those together and multiply them out, if I put one and multiply it by itself, I get zero, because this is Einstein's energy momentum mass equation. E squared minus P squared minus M squared equals zero. And as we know, that works for physics. And we can even do better in physics because we can do a canonical quantization of these and make it make this into a version of the Dirac equation. J just in, in two lines. So the two brackets represent the fundamental particle. In physics, that bracket represents the fundamental particle, and that represents its entire environment or the rest of the universe. But it's really valid for any self-organizing system and its environment, because they all work on this principle of two spaces. One which is distorted, one which isn't. And it does seem to work for the genetic code, which again has 64 units, just as the Dirac algebra has 64 units. So let's see how that can work. Let's see if we can represent that code mathematically now. So the genetic code has 64 codons, units of three bases from DNA or RNA bases. We've got three bases. Each forms a codon, and there are 64 possible codons. And the reason why there are 64 is because there are four bases, so 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. So there are 64 bases, there are 64 codons. The four bases, U, G, A, and C. And we've done quite a lot of previous investigations of this and shown how close it is to determining the behavior of not only fundamental particles, but also genetics as well. Many of the same things happen. You get the same... Um, but, uh, results from it. So what we're going to do is say we've got four vector units, four quaternion units, and four complex number units. And those are the three algebras that can collectively create this structure. And if we multiply those four by four by four, we'll get 64. <coughs> So the, in the genetic code, what's the point of the codons? Well, they code for amino acids. So each codon codes for a different amino acid. So I don't mean that each codon is, is differently codes than another one. I mean any codon will only code for one amino acid. Though several codons will code for one for the same amino acid. There are, in principle, 20 amino acids in the majority of species. And there are 64 codons. So the 64 codons between them code for 20 amino acids. So some, nearly all, are duplicated by another codon, but no codon codes for two amino acids. It's unique in its, its coding. And this is how we, we create uh, biological structure. They seem to be divisible into groups. And if you divide the <laughs> codons into groups, you, you find that they're about, they're, you can divide it in various ways, but there are about four groups that stand out. And those four groups, if you divide the 64 into four groups, you find that those four groups within them have got similar properties. So something keeps those connected into a kind of group within the 64. And of those, uh, what we found was that the best way to determine what group 
which, which uh, to, to divide into groups was to go for the middle base. The middle base seemed to determine the main properties of, of the group. The third base seemed to be almost redundant. It wasn't as important as the first one and the second one, but the second one was the most important in, in telling you what the nature of that, of the amino acid that was created was. So it's not the, the codons that are grouped, it's the amino acids, really. But the amino acid properties from those codons are grouped. <coughs> and so we can actually use our algebra. This, these representations, of course, are arbitrary, but it doesn't matter. As long as you get one that works, you can always convert it into a different one. So uh, this is... We, if we use the vector units for the first base, and the quaternion units, the red ones, for the second base, and the complex units for the third base. And, okay, then we can start looking. If we look at group one there, we see that we have all the, all the same middle base. And then we go through the vector bases for the first base, Missing one at the end there. It's behind there. I think we've, we've lost one, haven't we? Yeah. yeah, there's one down there. Sure. Yeah, you can you can just see it. Yeah. This is this is an important one actually. It's methionine, which is the which is the start one of the start codons. So that's a particularly important one actually. But you see that's another amino acid. So you can see how relatively regular it is. Okay. And then we go to group two. <laughs> and we have a different middle base, and again you can see how how uh, we go through uh, this cycle of uh, these vectors for the first base. Now this this is the only one that is a tall anomalous series. All the rest seem to to go true to form entirely, but just this one. I think we got one another one at the bottom there. It's not quite come on. Why is it anomalous? Well, I'll show you in a minute. You can't see from there that it's anomalous. It's because it reappears in the table. Mm. But no other does. Mm. Now, I, I must point out, by the way, this is only for one species, E. coli. This is E. coli. Mm. But there are. Um, the serine and arginine uh, change quite a bit, you know, a little bit between mm. species, particularly. Mm. So that's probably a species-specific variation rather than a general one. Mm. I'm just not expert enough in biology. Uh, my colleague's looking into that into the biological side of it. This is the third base. And this is beautifully regular. You see how, um, how, how perfectly this divides into, into twos. Uh, so each, each one of these has, four, has, has two, two groups of two. And then finally, equally regular, but in groups of four is this one. You see serine appears again, again here. But serine and arginine tend to be somewhat mixed up in bi biology. Mm. But generally speaking, there's very little anomaly in this. That this is, see how perfect this one is, groups of four. And how perfect the previous one, groups of two. Could you just come back, you said the quaternion group of base two is more important. Uh, yeah. You didn't say why. No, I said that seems to determine oh, the properties same. of the group. I think the third one doesn't matter very much, and it's well known that that's semi-redundant, the third base. But the, the, the second base seems to determine... See, these amino acids all have similar physical properties and chemical properties in this group, the way we group them. And same with all the other groups. The amino acids are similar, whereas they're dissimilar to the other groups. And it seems to be the, third, the middle base that decides that. Now, is why that is, is another question. Is this algebra uh, the most complex algebra that works, the quaternion? Yeah, it's the it's double it's complexified double quaternion. So it's the most complex that you can find in. Mathematics. Yeah, it's the it's the one that perfectly fits this situation. That that's the idea. It's the most complex that I think is really valid for physics. If if, but it also seems to be valid for other systems as well. So. Well, I don't know where the asterisks were. I think they're all in group one. You see, some of them got marked with an asterisk. They're start codons. They all appear in group one, for example. So that group one, you know, similar 
uh, properties, and all, they, it's, that has all the start codons in the, the ones that start the process. Okay. So the asterisk represents start codons, and it, notably they're all in the same group. Uh, they, also, the start and stop codons can be represented by negative. That's just an artifact of the presentation, but it's convenient. Uh, the way that the various structures uh, do for the amino acids, and that will hopefully it's slightly clearer in the next table. So this is group one. And so you can see there how, uh, the, this, how the, the amino acid is coded for in these, in these things. This is the one that we couldn't see on the first table, the thionine. And this is a very important one because this is... Uh, the, the, the most general start codon. And then that's group two. Uh, and I say this is the only thing that could be considered anomalous, this little bit here. But this is species specific. We don't believe it's generally true for all species. We believe it's an evolutionary uh, thing. And this, by the way, can be used as a tool to study evolution, which is what we plan to do study phylogeny and things like that, using this as a tool. Group 3, see how beautifully perfect group 3 is. And group 4, similarly absolutely perfect. So there's some sort of structure going on in this, in this process. And as I say here, we can see the pattern's almost perfect, uh, particularly groups 3 and 4. Only the two serine codons in group two are anomalous and not in their biological group. And, and that will happen in any arrangement. That's because arginine and serine seem to have two codons that should have originally coded for a different amino acid. That's what we think happened. If we go back to group two, go back to group two, this is a, a we think, if you look at arginine and serine, arginine's got six and serine's got two, and we think the first two of arginine, which these first two here of arginine, and these two for serine, really were coding for something else, a different amino acid, which has dropped out of the, of the process somehow. Uh, and a typical you know, way the, these things change biologically, because bi biology, of course, will always be, as it were, less perfect than physics, because you know, it's a bit more complex structure and there's more variation likely to happen. Tryptophan, for example, and stop. In other species, you find all switched around or, or t together or something. This, this doesn't always occur. And so if there was another amino acid where serine and arginine were, that would be 20. But we want, what we need to do is look at other species as well. Um, so arginine and serine seem to have two codines that could have been originally called into different amino acid. And so, almost certainly they become mixed at some stage in biological evolution for this species, E. coli. doesn't happen in other species. But there may be other anomalies in other species. There may be always a little bit of fiddling about in it. And arginine, well, well what you can notice is that Generally, you get a tendency for the more, if you look at the chemical structure of the amino acid, the more complicated it is, the, the fewer codon pathways it has. And that's, that would be obvious, wouldn't it? You'd expect more pathways for a less complicated molecule. So uh, something like arginine is actually quite complex compared to some of the other amino acids. And, and that seems to be an exception to that rule. And to say, I've just mentioned this. It may be that evolutionary drift may be determined to some extent, so we can actually use this to study evolutionary drift and other things of that kind. And I've mentioned here that the codon for tryptophan can become the stop codon in some species and vice versa. Now, we can also represent these structures geometrically, and this is using the icosidodecahedron or something of that kind. I mean, it's just a representation. It doesn't necessarily mean anything but think it may also have a genuine geometric significance. Now on these, you've got to imagine that there's minus as well as plus on these. Okay, so that's plus and minus. And imagine that we're looking at both sides of that. Either that or we're looking at vertices as well as faces because it's 32 and 32. We're on a top of 64. And 
th these are four quarters, if you like, of an icosi dodecahedron. And you can get the same structure, a nice little perfect little structure on these. This is just the algebra, so you would expect that to be more perfect structure. And then if you look at the, the, the uh, codons, that's what you would get. And related codons are, are connected to each other physically. Remember, you've got to wrap these things round to, to, to get the proper structure. We need to build up a three-dimensional model of it as well as this, this version. Uh, okay, so the third one, it shows the amino acids. And, uh, the related amino acids are connected. You see the leucine and leucine there, and valine and valine there, and so forth. And uh, remember that one of these is on one side of the structure, and one is on the other side as it's represented. And one of these things that you could say is when you're piecing this together, this gives you a clue that serine is there and serine and arginine are here, so that, that really must fit into there to show why these two are connected together. And this is how the crossover would have occurred you know, from that process. <coughs> so that gives you some idea how you can start connecting the four sections. And one of the things that's interesting uh, is that you can do this <coughs> arrangement. I'll just show it now. You can do this arrangement as well. But this one here, and you could follow it through with the codons and with the amino acid. This one here, you can see this has got nil potents in it, square roots of zero, because these three pentagons here and these two here form a nil potent structure. Also, these three triangles, all the five triangles, form a nil potent structure. So you've got a nil potency structure built within that. And there's a duality there because. Uh, yeah, I'll come to that in a moment. I think I've just mentioned this, haven't I? Yeah. At the same time, the five triangles taken together form another nil point structure. I've just shown you that. So the three inner triangles, the three pentagons, display a duality in that either group can be used with the two outer triangle to generate a set of nil potent units. I think that's, I think that's as much as I want to say about that. So this provides another way of generating 12 nil potent structures from the algebra. So nil potency is one of the assumed bases of the overall pattern we've described in nature's code. Well, when we say nature's code, we mean this is how these things operate. Nil potency means that the system and the environment are mirror images of each other, and uh, connected together they can create zero by addition or multiplication. It doesn't matter either way. It appears to be the means by which a self-organized system connects with its external environment. So its presence in these geometric structures indicates the real importance of ge geometry as well. In, in not so much in physics, but in biology, you expect geometry to be important because it's the positioning of these objects on this, the axis of this, uh, ob this RNA or DNA, or whatever it is. It's the positioning of those objects geometrically which will, to a large extent, determine what happens. So that's, we think that this is a, a, a you know, way of, of, of getting at that information. So I think that's, that's, a, that's about it for this presentation. Okay? Thank you. I have a question, Peter. I'm not sure if I wasn't paying full attention, but earlier on when you assigned the, um, one of the five component quaternion elements to the... Um, uh, energy charge. Oh yes, that one. Were were those the correlation of the two? Were they arbitrary, or do they have to be assigned that? No, way? no, they don't have to be these particular quaternions. They do have to. No, be. no. So you can assign. Yeah, you can be, shuffle those in any yeah, way. Yeah, you, you can want. shuffle them. Yeah, you can use any of the five. But it's always got to be so that this is a pseudo scalar with it. Yeah. That's important. That isn't. It doesn't matter which one that is. But that matters. And it doesn't matter whether they're plus or minus. And again, that doesn't matter. But these three have got to be the vector, and that's got to be the scalar. And so these red ones can be switched around any way you want. Of course, those blue ones could be switched around with each other. And the same thing, same maybe it's the same question for the UGU, UUC, CG. Yeah, yeah, you can switch them around. Because they can all be switched. Yeah, so they can be switched. The it's, algebra it's, that goes with guanine could be switched to the one with cytosine. The, the, actual, the actual algebra, but the structure of the algebra, not. 
Okay. So the structure that stays, but the actual particular <coughs> numbers don't. Uh, yeah. um, you said those are Clifford algebras? Yeah. Have you looked at Clifford's by quaternion system in 1873? Yeah, because the algebras are related to his by quaternion system. Yes, indeed they are. Then he built the by quaternion system to explain electromagnetism in yes. four dimensional space. Yes. And that's related to what I do. Yeah, well, it's related to uh, four vectors and so on. Yeah. Well, Cartan geometries and Cartan's binders and Penrose twisters are all based on that. Oh, yes, no, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'll mention Penrose in, in another okay. talk. Yeah, I know, I'm very interested in that. So, yeah. is, is there a connection between this uh, uh, quaternions and, uh, <coughs> and the Fourier space and the geometrical pattern of particles? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, is that, yeah. Does that completely explain the Fourier patterns? No, nothing's completely explained, but mm -hmm. one can get ideas that go towards explaining it. I see. You can understand it better that yeah, way. Yeah, you can understand it better. I think of some art. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, in your, in your, uh, in your diagram, uh, you know, on the Which DNA, you have a three, three, what do they call it? A three and a five inch, three of a DNA structure. Yeah. There's a three. Three and a five, yeah. Yes. Now, is that related to the to your triangle and pentagon? Yeah. Yeah, that's the three, three and five. That's the same three and five? That's three and the same three and five. Oh, okay. That one. And those. Perhaps those, perhaps, better for that purpose. Those. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm, yes. Uh, Sorry, well, the general in yeah. yeah. um, In the work I've been doing in electrodynamics, uh, we've been looking at biological systems. Yeah. And uh, we find that from the symmetry of the electrodynamic force laws <laughs> and combinatorial geometry, we're able to reproduce the basic structures of the genes. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, as you say, a, a, a geometrical thing. Yeah, oh yes, of course. And, and well, yeah, if you've got a paper on that, we'd be interested, yeah. Yeah. To see how, how uh, you know, we could correlate. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Uh, well, at the beginning you mentioned uh, physically space-time charge and mass. Yeah. I didn't see charge in there. Yeah, well, do you see that that's the that, that come out in my physics lecture, which we have to launch. Uh, but I'll show you. Charge is the red one. That's charge at the end there, and it's the charge that gets distorted, which is why you get symmetry breaking. The red one here is distorted. This is the charge, and you sort of stick that on those five. Let's imagine that if if it didn't mix with those five, it would be pure, and all the the electric and strong and weak charges and forces will be identical. But as it is, to, to, to group these together into one structure which will generate the whole algebra, you have to distort one of the three dimensionalities or the other. Now if it's charge, this one becomes connected with a pseudo scalar, which is where the SU2 aspect comes from for the weak interaction. This one's connected with a vector, which is where the SU3 aspect comes from the strong interaction. This one's connected to the scalar, which stays with the U1 for the electromagnetic interaction. So that's the idea of that. And in fact, I've been able to follow that through to actually get the, the uh, complete explanation of, of, of uh, how that happens. Uh, I may, I may, uh, I'll not mention it now, but I've brought a, a book with me, which is, I got the copies only the day before I came. I've got two copies with me, so you can look at them later, which doesn't talk about this biology, because that's not in the book. That's in the earlier book and in later later papers, but the the, uh, the physics side of it is in that book. So I, I have that book. I'll bring it tomorrow. Time for one or two more quick questions. Yes, uh, yeah, along the same lines. I was just wondering what your motivation was for considering the quaternion units as the uh, fundamental basis for charge. Would you be explaining that in your afternoon lecture? Well, I, I can tell you now. I don't know whether I, do, I can't remember whether I do, but I can tell you now. Essentially, if you look at electromagnetism and gravity, and you, you look at an inverse square law force, the gravity is attractive, the electromagnetism is repulsive. So why is one repulsive and one attractive? Well, if you had one unit was imagining one was real, then that would explain it. It can't be mass because mass only has one sign. Imaginary quantities have to have two signs by pure mathematics. So if you're going to use that representation, then the charge must be imaginary. If you've got three of them, then it's a good guess that they might be quaternion. Yeah, it seems reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Let's give another round of thanks to Peter. Uh,
Our next speaker is uh, Divyendu Panagrahi. They're not points in the sense that you can actually fix that position, but they are points in the sense that you can't actually find a definite size to physical particle like an electron. And this point singularity actually provides the entry into the other quantities that make up the second physical space. So you've got space, and you've got everything else, and the connection between them is a point singularity, and it's like kind of going into another space through that singularity. So this relates to yet another question. Can we use geometry to construct physics? Just geometry. And everybody knows that all we can do is observe space. There isn't anything else we can observe. All the other observations are translated from observations of space. There never, were, there never was a time observation. There's only a clock observation, which is a spatial observation. <coughs> and people have actually tried to construct everything just in terms of space. That was the whole point of Cartesian philosophy. Matter is just extension and so forth. It's also behind quite a bit of general relativity, collusive line, unified field theory, and even now string and membrane theories. But never have we actually managed to do it in a satisfactory way. So, and people talk about multi-dimensions and they glibly say there's so many dimensions, oh, we need that number, or we need that number. But never have we got past the fact that the world we observe is three-dimensional space. That's all we ever observe, three-dimensional space. Well, obviously, there's something else there, but we don't observe it. So from the observational point of view, there's only three-dimensional space. So can we find a geometrical way of constructing this so that we can create a bigger geometry which still preserves the three-dimensionality of space as we observe it? I'm going to say that the will isn't in fact three-dimensional or constructed from space of any dimensionality whatsoever. That's not the what the will is constructed from. It doesn't have any structure. It in fact is zero totality, there's no structure. <coughs> and so how can we get no, some structure from no structure? Well, there's only one way, and that's duality. We have to have something, another space in some way, which cancels the space that we normally observe. We need a dual partner to our Euclidean space. And if we actually can, can provide this dual partner, we can not only solve that problem, but we can provide an algebraic geometry, very much in the Clifford style, which has remarkable parallels to the one that we actually see. Now, so let's go back to three-dimensionality, which is a key aspect of space. There's no point pretending that three-dimensionality isn't very, very important. You, you, you can create as many dimensions as you like, but we can't get around the fact that three-dimensionality is special in some way. Why is it special? Well, the only insight we ever got into the special nature of three-dimensionality was the discovery of quaternions. Because that told us that there was something different at that particular dimensionality and no other. And that something was anti-commutativity. Anti-commutativity and three-dimensionality are the same thing, just representations of, of, of exactly the same concept. So we, we have four quaternion units, I squared, J squared, K squared, and one. So the unit, unit, and the three ones that square to minus one. Three square roots and minus one. If we make these units anti-commutative, but still associative, then there's no other dimension we can have other than three. That's a mathematical theorem proved by Frobenius, 1878. We can't actually put another dimensionality once we've accepted that the anti-commutative, that ij equals minus ji, and so forth, and once we've accepted that they're still associative, then we can only have three dimensions. We can't have two, we can't have four, we can only have three. However, what we can do is to complexify quaternions. We can 
bring in the complex I as well as the IJK, which, so these are dimensional, this is not dimensional, this is just a pseudo scalar, just a scalarish type term, and we can complexify these dimensions. And if we do that, it's convenient to, to change our symbolism from bold italic I to straight italic I. So this is now a complexified version of the quaternion I. And we, we can complexify these, these and we, if we also complexify the one, then the partner for these three, I, J, and K, is this ordinary I. And if we do that, we now get these multiplication rules, I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals 1. And we don't need to worry about that one particularly. But these are also anti-commutative. And I, J equals minus J, I. And the very important thing here is that they, they don't equal K. They, unlike quaternions, where I, J equals K, these equal i times k. And that's because of the extra i that we had when we multiplied i i by i j. <coughs> Is this a, a regular algebra one? Oh, absolutely standard. Absolute standard. Uh, Hamilton did it. He called it, he called it by quaternions. But it's no what Clifford called by quaternions. It's, it's in fact this is, in fact, the multivariate vector algebra, Clifford algebra of three-dimensional space. It's, it's absolutely complete standard algebra. This, these are vectors. But the vectors with an extra property, they, they introduce spin. Vectors of this kind bring in spin, whereas ordinary vectors don't. It's also often called Pauli algebra. Yeah, it's the same as the Pauli matrices. The Pauli matrices <laughs> op operate in the same way. It's a, it's a cyclic, anti-commutative algebra, completely standard. And that is the true algebra of space. Ordinary vector algebra is not the algebra of space, this is the true algebra of space. Which is why we get spin. We wouldn't get spin if it weren't true. So these are, uh, I've mentioned that they have quite a number of names. They're called multivariate vectors by Hesterners. They have all the properties of ordinary vectors, except they also have a full algebraic product. So instead of just having a dot product and a cross product, they have a combination of the two called the full product just as quaternions would. And this term here is what really brings in spin. The second term, this cross product term. So there are dot product plus i times the cross product. And if we do that, then we get all the rules concerning vector multiplication from them. There are isomorphic to power matrices. And in more general terms, as I say, the, the units of the Clifford or geometric algebra of three-dimensional space. So they've got many names. Well, it's, the, it's the key algebra in the, in, the, in the world, basically. It's the key algebra which explains space and everything of that kind. Of course, if we choose to do it the other way around, if we, we start with the vectors and we complexify these, we end up with quaternions. The, the, we'll have a sign changer here and there, but it doesn't really matter whether it's plus or minus at this, at this level. So complexifying these gives us quaternions. And we, apart from quaternions, these also have another name which you're very familiar with, but these are actually pseudo vectors. Axial vectors, the same thing as pseudo vectors or axial vectors. For example, area, angular momentum, and such um, axial vectors. And then volume, things like volume, are pseudo scalars. And in fact, all real vectors are of that type. There aren't any ordinary vectors in nature. There's none that follow the ordinary rules of vector algebra. They all follow this rule. So this is how we would map out the algebra. We have the three vector units, the three bivector, also called pseudo vector, also quaternion. We have the tri vector. That's the product of two orthogonal vectors. This is the product of three <coughs> orthogonal vectors. And we even call it the triple product when we do the volume. We even call it the triple product. And it is literally a triple product, just a triple product. And that's the tri-vector. It's also called a pseudo-scalar. And then we've got the scalars. So pseudo-vectors and pseudo-scalars give us areas and volumes. So in effect, we're kind of doubling our components. We've got one lot of that, and we've got another lot like that. So we're kind of doubling the components that we have. And vector algebra is twice the size of quaternion algebra because you've got the complexification. 
Now let's suppose we've got another algebra exactly the same. So there's that algebra and there's that algebra. The only difference is I've used different colours. Let's suppose that these two are isomorphic. So we've got two such algebras. And you may be familiar with that from my earlier talk, but it's not quite the way I wrote it there. This is just using vectors. If we combine those two algebras commutatively in a tensor product, so we, we take each one of those base units and multiply them as many times as we can until we can't do any new multiplications, we obtain 64 terms which are plus and minus values of these. So this is a double vector algebra, a double Clifford algebra of three-dimensional space. So there are 64 terms in that, we've already been to that. And that's the same as that one, which we, is the one that we used before. All that I'm doing there is shifting the i, the, the, this i, shifting the position of that to be multiply. If, if we multiply it out by, by that, we simply shift the position of that. So if we combine it, one of these vectors with a quaternion algebra, we'll get exactly the same algebra. It just looked slightly differently because we're using quaternion labels instead of vector ones. But it's exactly the same algebra. There's no difference whatsoever. And the, the third version of it is to have a double quaternion algebra complexified. So a double quaternion complexified algebra will actually be the same as the double vector algebra. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same as the as that, and the Pauli algebra and anything else you want to call So there are three, three versions we can use using these symbols. But effectively, we, we, if we look at it in that format, you can see we've got double space. We've got two spaces, red one and the blue one, which are commutative with each other. Right, I'm saying that this, once we've done that, we've got a very powerful tool for any fundamental physics we want to do. Because this is isomorphic to the gamma algebra, the pal sorry, not the Pauli algebra, the double Pauli algebra, the gamma algebra, the Dirac equation. This is the algebra of relativistic quantum mechanics of the fermionic state. Now, the gamma algebra uses four by four matrices, but you can actually derive it from two sets of Pauli matrices. So these are identical to using those. So you can use two sets of Pauli matrices and you can derive all the gamma matrices from those. Not often done, but that's what you can do. Which is identical to deriving them from two vector spaces. So, for some reason, relativistic quantum mechanics requires a double vector space. And that's in, in addition to the doubling we get because of the complexification. So it's another doubling. And the units form a group of order 64, and we've seen before that we needed just five generators. You can't do it with less than five generators. You, if, you can only do it with four if you, if you complexify afterwards, so you really need five, whatever you do. The five generators can be matched to the gamma matrices. Those are examples. You see, we had something like these, these terms in the previous talk. These. And you can see you can map those to the gamma matrices. Or we can do it in a vector format. This is a double vector format. That's a vector quaternion format. And as I mentioned before, what happens is that one of the spaces actually loses its symmetry because... This is the minimal, and 5 is never, never a true symmetry. 5 is always a broken symmetry. You take quintic equations, you take quasi-crystals, take any sort of 5 whatsoever, and you will never preserve your symmetry. It's always a broken symmetry. 5 is not a, a true symmetry in nature. So if we make it 5, and we make it 5 because that's minimal, and we always go to the minimum, then we break a symmetry. And the one that we're breaking is this red one. Because you can see the K is associated with a 1 there. <coughs> it's a, uh, actually, that, shouldn't, that should be, I think that should be a IJ. Uh, that should be a, an I times J. And, but here you can see it's associated with these three blue things. So they're, they're not associated with the same objects. They're associated with something different. It's a broken symmetry. Let me just point out a special subset of this algebra. A special subset of this algebra, a very interesting subset. It's called the H4 algebra, also called double numbers. And the H4 algebra, well, you can create it by using 
the, the paired quaternions I and I, and J and J and K and K. And if they're always paired, they're always multi a multiplication of two, then this creates this subalgebra. And you can see that this is a commutative algebra, it's not an anti-commutative algebra, and it, its norm is one. It, it creates one. And it's just got four units, those four, and th these are actually part of the main group of order 64, but a special subset of it. It's a cyclic but commutative algebra with those multiplication rules. <coughs> it's, it's a particularly interesting algebra for many reasons. And you can also get the same algebra by using negative versions of the double vectors. It doesn't work with positive ones, it works with negative ones. So if I, if I go through that, I get one again. It's exactly the same rules as I got before. Cyclic, commutative, norm one. Now the reason why that's particularly interesting is because we can, we can represent it in a group table and that group has got very interesting properties. This group here is the Klein 4 group, a non-cyclic group of order 4. Um, it's, there's, there's only two groups of order 4 and one of them is the cyclic group and the other one is the non-cyclic group which is this one. And this is also called the Klein 4 group. So this double vector algebra has is structured on the Klein 4 group. I'm, I'm sorry, that's not the double vector algebra, this is the H4 algebra. The double vector algebra is the big algebra, this is a, a small component of it, where you take the vectors in pairs. And so, the double vector algebra, the big algebra, allows us to create a very efficient version of relativistic quantum mechanics. So we just begin with Einstein's energy momentum conservation equation, which is that, leaving out the C's, C equals 1, H equals 1 in all this, H cross equals 1 and C equals 1, and use the algebra to factorize the equation. I'm going to use this version, the quaternion vector one. I could have used any of the three, but I'm going to use that one. And you mentioned Penrose earlier. We've got a very similar structure to Penrose's twisters because you've got four norm one ones, four norm minus ones, four that square to one, four that square to minus one. However, there is a difference because Penrose's twisters don't have this extra structure within the four and the four. And they're called twisters because Clifford called the spin when you're talking about a twist. Okay. So even the name comes from Clifford. Yeah. I think Penrose has really not got something fantastic there, but he doesn't have quite enough structure to get it to work. Because he just needs that little bit of structure in the fours and it might work. However, the, the connection between the units of space and time is a quantum rather than a classically relativistic one in this formulation. Now even in conventional relativistic quantum mechanics, this is what everybody says, it's a four vector connection, it isn't a four vector connection. If you do conventional quantum mechanics, relativistic, you have I gamma naught d by dt plus gamma dot del. You don't have d by d, uh, i d by dt plus del. That's four vector, but you've got gamma naught in front of the d by d, dt and you've got gamma in front of the del. So, in fact, you've got another term in front of the space and time terms. It's not a true four vector. It's a four vector within, it structured within something bigger. So people talk about relativistic quantum mechanics. The connection between t space and time is not that of a true ball four vector. It's mediated by the gamma matrices with different gammas from the space and time components. So it's a more subtle connection than simple four vectors. Now we can use our algebra simply to factorize this equation. And I'm going to factorize this in that way using our algebra. So I can factorize it directly. I don't have to use complex conjugates, and this is the beauty of this system. I can just factorize directly, get a square, square root of zero. And people often ask me how can you can get a square root of zero. You can do it with a three, four, five triangle. It's trivial. Mm -hmm. I'll show anybody afterwards if they want. It, and there's an infinite number of them. The object of this, this is a, a nil potent, a square root of zero. There are many different types of nilpotent, but a nilpotent is something where repeated operation, the same operation, leads to zero. This is just multiplication operation, and 
it, it only done, it has to be done once. And once we got that, we can start doing a really powerful version of quantum mechanics, relativistic, which is easier to use than non-relativistic. And I'm trying to get all kinds of problems done to connect, uh, to, to solve all the problems that can be done non-relativistically, relativistically using this method because it's, it's more powerful. So let's just do a canonical quantization on that. Just the standard thing. I'm going to use a, 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 a free, free wave function. So that's my phase factor there. And I'm going to use a, a differential operator of that kind. A standard one, H, you know, the usual uh, E becomes D by DT, and uh, P becomes del minus. And we, 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 need to, we need four terms in this. We'll need four terms, so I'm going to do that now. So that plus and minus really is a row, a row vector with four, going through all the, the cycle of four different signs. And that's really a column vector going through all the cycle of four different signs of E and P. So we simply replace E and P by the operators, ID by DT. I'm leaving H cross out, H cross equals 1. P goes to minus I del. And that's the standard thing. We assume that the act on this free, free uh, fermion uh, phase factor, and this gives us now Dirac equation for a, for a free particle, the nilpotent version. Now, I'm not going to do what Heston has already done. He's, he's shown a multivariate vector for the P or del term automatically includes spin. And this is, as I mentioned, because of the extra I, I times cross product term. So, in fact, here, P is interchangeable with sigma dot p and, and del with sigma dot del. It, it produces the same effect whichever you use. So I can use either of them. We need four simultaneous solutions, if it's the Dirac equation. Two fermion and anti-fermion, two for spin up and down. So I don't need that matrix differential operator which is horribly messy to use. With 16 terms in it, I just need four terms which have got uh, these, these versions in it. So we can use a row vector operator instead of this horrible 4x4 four four matrix. And a column vector wave function, each of which may be represented in abbreviate. So this stands for either the operators or the, or the wave function. Because you can use the same symbolism for either. So these are the four, these are the four solutions that are immediately obvious. That's the fermion spin up, fermion spin down, anti-fermion and anti-fermion spin up and down. Of course, the plus and minus signs are arbitrary, but, it, it, but that's the variation. If you choose one sign convention, then you stick with it. So the observed particle state will always be the first in the column. So that's what the observed particle state is. But with the Dirac wave function, you've always got to have all four terms. Psi 1, Psi 2, Psi 3, Psi 4. You can't just have one of them. Well, the others, what are the others? Well, the others are the vacuum state into which it could be converted by any natural process, any standard uh, variation that's available. In other words, the three, the three things that you can do with a fermionic wave function automatically are parity transformation, time reversal transformation, charge conjugation, P, C, and T. And in... in there we do it by putting operators on either side of the bracket. If we do that, mathematically that will change the P over. If we do that, that will change the E over. And if we do that, that will change both of them, which is what we call a charge conjugation. So you see that those three terms on the right are the same as our three vacuum <coughs> terms in the wave function. So, so what our wave function means with four states is we've got the particle state, and then we've got the three possible transformations that it can have. Nothing ever happens to mass. No, nothing ever happens to mass because mass is, connects the vacuum and the particle. That's what mass is all about. Mass is zitterbewegung, it comes from zitterbewegung, which is a switching between the particle state and the vacuum state. And therefore, it's not a separate thing. It's, it, the, these are vacuum terms, and that's the particle term. And the particle and vacuum give you mass together, so nothing happens to mass, it belongs to both. And in fact, you can actually do this uh, using uh, discrete 
differentiation, if you like, using, uh, Lou does a lot of this, using um, commutators. Commutators. You can use commutators instead of deferentials for these two. And when you do that, the mass term disappears. So you can actually write it without the mass term if you, if you use commutators instead of differentials. But your J term still stays. Well, it does in the wave function. The, 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 this is for the operator. In the, in the wave function, you've still got a mass term, but in the operator, you, you, you can get rid of it to show that. So you will just have these, these, these two first terms, and you wouldn't have the mass term in the operator aspect. OK. So replacing the observed Fermi state with any of the others will simultaneously transform all four states. So I'm, go I'm going to often just write one term down, but, I, but always think that there are four terms. Because things won't work out unless you use all four terms. But I will often write just the first term because it's too cumbersome to write all four down. So let's just assume that they are. And the interesting thing about this is that these, unlike conventional relativistic quantum mechanics, these are not independent of that. They're just drones. They're just automatic sign variations. So there is only one term. There is only one term in the wave function. There's only one term in the operator. All the other three are just automatic consequences, so they're not independent information. And in fact, not only that, but the wave function and operator are not independent. They're the same as well. And that's the power of this method. Now, I'm going to have a look at something here. If I put k in front of this, and k in front of that, and go to infinity with that, and I were to work that out, what I would get, when I just did it with once with this, so I put that bracket and I put k and then that, I would just get this, this times a scalar. So the scalar will be normalized away. You can re restructure it so you, you do normalization at 1. So in fact, this times this is just that. And it can do it infinitely, and it doesn't make any difference. In other words, the, the fermion will not respond in any significant way or change itself in any way by being multiplied <coughs> by that, <coughs> post multiplied by that. And the same happens with J and I. These are idempotents or idempotents. So a nilpotent squared becomes zero. An idempotent squared becomes itself. So A squared equals A, if you like. So th these, are, these are of that nature. And we can regard these as vacuum operators. So I'm operating on a vacuum operator, and I'm getting nothing different. It's just the same as it was, as we would expect it to be. OK, and we could actually use these instead of that. We could actually use these. So you see, I'm, I'm operating on this other, some, some direction in this other space, this red space, and I'm getting no change. So it's a vacuum as far as that is concerned. So this is why I call this vacuum space, this red one. So I call that vacuum space because you can see that it's <coughs> like three directions, orthogonal directions in, in another space, which is not our space, it's vacuum space. Now, so that's very important. Uh, Nilpotent quantum mechanics, that means that any operator of this form automatically generates its solutions. I just need to write down the operator, and then there's only one wave function it can ever use. There's only one phase it can ever apply to. Once I've written down my operator, and even just the first term of the operator, and even just the first two terms out of the three in the first term of the operator, as soon as I've written that down, then everything's sorted. There's nothing new to do, because that will automatically create a phase factor and that phase factor will create an amplitude when, it's, when the um, differential operator is applied, which will square to zero. And that's, the, and that's the crucial thing. So I haven't got any other information other than the operator. And that's the whole information describes the entirely the system, entirely the interaction with the rest of the universe and, and everything. We don't need any equation at all. All we need is the operator. Now, it, I started with a free particle for convenience, but it doesn't need to be free. I can change these to add phase, uh, to 
potentials and things, or I can have covariant derivatives, doesn't matter. It's still just an operator, and that operator will produce a unique phase, which only that operator would produce, which produces a unique amplitude which squares to zero. So once I've written down the operator, I've solved it. We can still represent the operator in this way, instead of having to write down differentials, but the phase terms won't be this anymore. They'll be completely different. It will be ever w whatever's needed to create an amplitude of this general form which squares to zero. So that's the power of this particular method. And it's not only better methodology, but it gives us a more incisive understanding of what's happening in this quantum mechanics. And we can do many new results. Here's, here's the three boson type states. To get the three boson type states, which we can possibly have, spin one like that. We, we flip over the energy term. Or, or spin zero, we flip over the energy and the momentum term. And then remember, we can do this with either operators or wave functions. It doesn't matter which we use. Or we flip over both, and we get the Fermi and Fermi combin combination like both Einstein condensate and that sort of thing. Cooper pairs, whatever you want to call it. Now, very interestingly, if you, if you reduce that, if you get rid of the mass in that one, and you multiply it out, you will get a scalar term. You'd get a, a scalar term which is non-zero. If you take this one <coughs> and, re and remove the mass, and you multiply it out, you don't get a scalar term, you get zero. So this spin zero boson, sorry, the spin one boson can be massless, but the spin zero boson can't. As we've found out in the last couple of years with the Higgs and so on. The Higgs boson has to be massless, the Goldstone boson doesn't exist. S spin zero massless doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in this mathematics at all. <coughs> So, effectively, this, I'm just summarizing what you, what's the procedure. You write down your, this is my operator. I've not written as an operator, but that E is an operator for E, and that's an operator P. That in, it uniquely determines the phase factor, which makes the amplitude nil potent. No equation needed. Operating on, on factoring on phase factor squared equals amplitude squared equals zero. Don't even use the Dirac equation. Don't use any equation. So what does a nilpotent operator do? It always splits the universe into two halves. When the fermion is created, whatever that may mean, it splits it and the, the rest of the universe are two halves of, of one thing. And they're mirror images of each other. <coughs> so there's a local part which is represented by the fermion and a dual, non-local vacuum part which is the rest of the universe. So. Imagine that we've got nothing at all, nothing at all, and we create a fermion out of nothing. And it's got various, let's imagine it's got various potentials involved in this fermion. So we create the fermion out of nothing, and then what we get is the hole in nothing left by the fermion, which is vacuum. Vacuum is the rest of the universe that's needed to create the fermion in that particular state. Is that the same as saying you've created the virtual image? Yeah. It's a virtual image of the fermion. Kind of. mm. Like polarization stories. Yeah, yeah they're very like that. And polarization is a particular case of it, really. Mm. It's a really just a particular case of it, isn't it? Mm. Because you're... you're you... so Except there's real, there's real charges moved around on oh, the... Yeah, well, your vacuum does have real charges. Uh -huh. Because you, to get those right. potentials, you've got to have real charges. Right. So it, Imagine it create, have to create everything which is possible to make that fermion exist in that state. Yeah. And that, that everything happens to be the rest of the universe, yeah. as we understand it. Right. But the rest of the universe looks like the fermion when you add it all up. Right. It's virtual image on top of itself. <laughs> yeah. It's minus, if you like, it's a minus. Mm -hmm. So a fermion in any state needs to create the entire universe which makes it possible. And this makes possible in my view, a Wheeler one fermion type theory of the universe, an interesting possibility. It's seriously possible to imagine this version, this, this, this metaphor for quantum mechanics. 
the fermion in the entire universe are a dual pair. And so you can think of the, the universe, except for that fermion, as entirely equivalent to the single particle. And it has to be an interacting one, of course, because it couldn't possibly not be. But. So, so where does the firm formalism come from? Well, what I'm saying is that space is a non-conserved quantity, as I mentioned at the beginning. Translation, rotation, symmetry. It can't define itself on a point. It can't fix on a point. It can't define it on its own a point. It requires something else to do it. It's got to have a partner to make it possible. And that partner is a space, as it were, very like itself. And that will create the particle singularity. So mathematicians discuss points in ordinary 3D space. But if, if we didn't have this physical structure, we couldn't begin to talk like that. The, the, the points physically have no meaning in space itself. <clears throat> but identity become, becomes possible physically because we've got two spa spaces. And I'm going to use an mm. argument from topology reversed mm. here. And this is simply connected space, no singularity, just ordinary space. And you go around a, a closed circuit, parallel transport, a vector around that circuit. Start there, come back to there, and it will be pointing in the same direction. <coughs> Create a, a circuit with a singularity in it, a multiple connected space, and you parallel transport the vector around it, and it will be pointing in the opposite direction. And in a sense, that's because when you've got <coughs> a, a singularity in it, um, that you're, you're creating... Um, it's like a fermionic state. You need two spaces to create that singularity. And that other space, it spends half the time in that, which is why it's only pointing halfway. Why well, it's got to go around twice to get to back to, the, to where it started. <coughs> so I'm saying for fermions, we can describe real space and vacuum space as the two spaces. And the vacuum space is everything else other than space of that connected with the fermion. And this space is closely connected with, the ch with charge, because remember that red thing is really charge, we, we talked about it in the previous talk, and the weak strong electric interactions, as well as the, the three possible transformations. So we can say that a fermion always exists in this, the space, the two spaces from which it's constructed, and the non-classical Zitterbewegung motion which is in and out of vacuum all the time, the thing that Schrodinger discovered in the Dirac equation represents the switching between the two spaces making it possible to, the, to actually have the fermion as point singularity in the first place. And that is, if you like, the point singularity is the intersection between the two spaces. It's the crossover point. So, this Singularity determines that they're exactly dual, and each contains the same information as the other, but it's in a different form. One's delocalized totally, the other one's totally localized. We're observers within the system, and we're forced to privilege one space with respect to the other. We have to maintain the symmetry of one, lose that of the other. And I think this is very similar to the way we do binary numbers. When we do binary numbers, we've only got two symbols, zero and one. So we, we, we put down 1, that's fine, that's 1. So minus 1, how do we get minus 1? Well, we have, we have a, a long string of 1s, an infinite string of 1s. And we add 1 at the end, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1, and you, you knock, them all, knock all the 1s over like dominoes. Of course, in reality, we, do, we, we, we can't have an infinite string, but we can have a finite long string, which is longer than the, the memory structure that we need. So... We actually use that in computing to complement. Uh, we use that, and this is like a number vacuum, similar to our vacuum. So minus 1 is symmetric to 1, but it looks totally different in binary. So the universe is symmetric to the fermion, but it looks totally different because we're forced to privilege the fermion. It's the same as we're forced to privilege 1. Question. Question. Um, do you think of this production of the singularity as analogous to an observation in quantum mechanics, where the non-localized particle suddenly becomes 
That's an, that's an aspect, yeah. That you 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 um, that put forces you to go in one direction in time and so on, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yes. that's right. It's yeah. an aspect. It is an aspect. Uh, I think I'll skip that because that's a loose speciality. He knows more about than I do, so he'll probably ask me a question I can't answer. <laughs> So the Fermian singularity produces an asymmetry or chirality in the space of observation because of its combination of the asymmetric nilpotent structure with the unobservable dual vacuum space. That's what I'm saying. That's why it looks chiral. And by the way, that's why we privileged left-handedness over right-handedness for fermions and right-handedness over left-handedness for anti-fermions. But the zeroing that we get, the point singularity, is... is uh, shows that the information in the two spaces is identical. And so it defines this as the norm zero crossover point between the two spaces. So as I've said, we've got to lose the symmetry of one space to preserve that of the other. We can't do both. So this is what we've done here. When we do this, when we do this, we actually, when we put those together, this one becomes energy, that one becomes mass, that one becomes momentum. But we didn't have those concepts before we actually put all those together. The space with the unsymmetry, uh, one broken symmetry is blue, the, the, the space of observation. The other one is the one we can never observe. So in nilpotent quantum mechanics, the universe becomes exactly zero. And Pauli exclusion is an obvious consequence. So imagine that we created this wave function then we've got, to, we've got a hole in nothing, so we've got, this is the wave function here, this is the hole in nothing, this is the vacuum. So if I do a, a superposition, I get nothing, I do a combination, I get nothing. So on the previous slide, uh, you have I... Uh, because that's, I've used vectors, I've used vectors oh, there. Yeah, uh, I get confused. Yeah, it is a bit confusing. Okay. I've used vectors rather than quaternions, oh, I've used okay. quaternions in this one. I know it's a bit confusing. That's the reason that I missed yeah. it on the That's end. right. Oh, yeah. okay. I looked at it myself and I thought, I've got that wrong, but I realized <laughs> it's in vectors. That's because I wanted to emphasize that there were two spaces. Right. That's why I use vectors. But a power exclusion says no two fermions can share the same vacuum. That's a, a neat way of expressing it. And note that the two processes define global and local. You haven't thought about the, the difference between multiplication and addition. Well, addition is really local, but uh, global. The multiplication is local. It's a local connection. Just, a, just an interesting observation. Local in what sense? Well, it means that every bit of this lot is connected with every bit of that lot. Uh, in local. So every, it's a sort of peculiar local. That's the multiplication. Yeah, multiplication. When you just okay, do it, it's it just an only global connection. That's that's just a, something of of as an aside. So the nilpotent defines a continuous vacuum, and everything is part of this. However, these operators suggest that we can split the continuous vacuum into discrete components with a dimensional structure. And we go back to this now. You see, this is one of the components of vacuum. It's not the whole vacuum. It's one part of the vacuum. It's, vac it's the weak vacuum, the vacuum connected with the weak force. Yeah, we've done that before. So now the multiplication is also equivalent. It's also equivalent to a time reversal. Because if I go back to that, go back to that, you see, if I do K on either side, if you remember, that flips that one over. And then there's no K in front of that one, so that's normal. And the next one flips over. So what we get is that. See, we get that. The, the, every, every other one flips over. And that gives us... That gives us a spin one boson. And yet still, this is just that. It's still just that. In other words, the fermion and, it, and the boson are the same thing. We have a natural supersymmetry. We don't need any new supersymmetric particles. It's naturally supersymmetric. So, oh, does that mean that the electron and the proton are the same particle? No, it means the electron, it, the electron is the same as its own vacuum partner boson, selectron if you like. Yeah. It's not the, nothing to do with the proton. It's it, it, the super supersymmetries have this particle called the selectron, which is the bosonic partner to the electron. 
Well, the electron is the selectron because that that's a boson, but that's the same as, as that. Where do the electrons live experimentally? Where do they live? I mean, where do you find them? What kind of experiment do you do to see a selectron? Electron? Well, a selectron. Oh, you could, you, it's not a selectron. It's, it's, it's just the electron. Yeah. yeah. I'm saying the electron is its has its own vacuum particle. What you call the selectron, no? Or my or miss here or something? You, yeah, I did call it the selectron, but you never see that. You only ever see an electron. Oh, oh okay. You can't see them. Yeah. Because they're only an electron. Mm. What's what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they're, they're vacuum. They're not real. Uh huh. They're not real like the electron. They're virtual something. Yeah, right. they're virtual. Mm. But but. That's all you need to get your supersymmetry sorted. That's all you need to get your yeah. renormalization sorted. You only need virtual. And so we have you know, a, a, a natural supersymmetry. I'll leave that. Uh, let me just mention something else. Pauli exclusion is, we've shown it's due to nil potency, but we can do it the conventional way, anti-symmetric wave functions, and we end up with this. When we do all the cancellations, we end up with just this. Now that, to me, is very striking, because once I've got that, all, all I've got left is the P2 and P1. In other words, the direction of the spin of the two fermions is all that stops them from being nothing. It's only the direction of the spin. So all the information which distinguishes those two fermions is in the pure direction, not even the magnitude, just the direction of the angular momentum operator. Just the direction. Mm. Quite extraordinary. I think I might just leave that out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and in fact, you can do it two ways. I'll leave that out as well. Um, I think I'll leave that because uh, we, we're going towards the end now. Anyway, let's have a look. See what the origin of this other space is. Where do we get it from? So Clifford algebra is three subalgebras: scalar complex numbers. Quaternion algebra, scalar trivector and bivector. And each of these is an algebra in its own right. And each of these has a quantity associated with it. If I look at this, everything else but space is that are these three. This one here is a quaternion operator, this is a time, and this is mass. I, I, there's no space there. The space is only created by combining them nominally, notionally. There isn't any of that. We can create that if we put all three together. So if we treat them as everything else, then though we can't observe it as a space, we can create it mathematically as a space, even though there isn't any, any physical space there to, to do it. Yet we can also see that the symmetry breaking that breaks the energy momentum, creates these things, also breaks the symmetry between these three red objects, which are the charges. Because that is associated with a different object to that one and that one. And ultimately, we can show that that is an SU2 symmetry, an SU3, and a U1. So it, 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 we can even do that. We can even see how we can get 10 dimensions if we really want that. Because we've got these five here, and we've got those five. And we've got, we got particle, and we've got vacuum, or particle and vacuum, whichever way you want. So we need 10. So they're not ordinary dimensions, but they're ten dimensions, and six of them are compactified because. Because why? I'm oh, sorry. They're compactified because. Because they're they're, 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 they're too little. Conserved. They're conserved quantities. There's only two of them are <coughs> energy momentum. Mm. All the rest are completely fixed quantities. Mm. From that point of view. <coughs> now. Um, physical significance of the H4 algebra, I don't want to do too much on this, but this is a very important algebra. And so let me just show you something here. This is where it all starts, where all this work starts. That there are only four parameters that if one sets out all their properties in this format, then one realizes that they've got a Klein-4 symmetry, which is the symmetry of the H4 algebra. We can map this onto the H4 algebra or the Klein-4 group. This is the, 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 the place where I started with this. I 
don't want to go into this. All I want to mention here is that if we actually construct mathematical spinners, this is too technical to be interesting in generally, but we construct mathematical spinners, we'll get objects like that. And we can see that we're using the, the double numbers to do it. These are, the, these are the four spinners that we would create if we wanted to generate our four wave functions by spinners. And you notice that these things here are exactly dual. So when you're talking about spin, that's the only thing in which the two spaces have got the same status. Because we can't separate them in, in the spinners. So that's just a, a thing of interest. I, want, I don't want to discuss that. The, the one always associated with mass, right? So you yeah. don't have any switch inside. No, you don't have any switch inside of the mass. But the, but the others you do. Uh, that's a very technical thing, so I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave this. I'm going to come to my conclusion now. So many people have thought def redefinition space might lead to a description of physics in terms of a single concept. But I don't think that's going to work. But if we have dual vector spaces, each commutative with the other, then we can immediately construct relativistic quantum mechanics and describe the fermion state with the what properties we want. Uh, it, it, when we look at the structure, we find the two spaces contain identical information. The apparently broken symmetry, observed through the quadratic geometry of ordinary space, when we look at the spinners, becomes a perfect unbroken symmetry. And by the way, that's a quartic geometry that connects them, which defines a single quantity through which the spaces combine. That's the spin which contains all the information about it. Uh, and I say the symmetry appears to be broken because the underlying group structure requires five generators, and that's automatically a broken symmetry. OK. The Klein-4 group appears to be the symmetry which is most significant to the fundamental level. And it, I, 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 believe, I believe the Klein-4 group is the only, uh, is the only group that works uh, with cellular automata not good, that can, can maintain uh, a long, ter long time uh, structure with cellular automata. So I, uh, I was thinking of looking at that sometime, but uh, I won't discuss that now. Okay, thank you. Oh, God. <laughs> this sounds terrific, so I, I, I wanted to verify what I simple terms that I wrote out to you, telling me that space, time, charge, and mass, yep. I start with those yep. and use this algebra, that's all I need? That's all you need. Yep. Thanks. If you really want to read about it, <laughs> here's the plug. <laughs> I've only got two copies with me, but this is the book that I've just published. I, I, I brought copies of it. There's lectures by me on the internet that you can get under that title. Well, this is the book, and uh, I'll leave those for people to have a look at. Ten lectures on YouTube, very good. I've watched them several times. YouTube? Yes. yes. I put in FOPL1 through FOPL10, right? Yeah, but just put my name in, put those in, you get them up. Name. Yeah, put my name right. in, get I them up straight away. thumb drive, an Electra 2. Lecture 2, I think, is an H4D2 algebra, which if you have a chance to peruse that, that's the one that we will use to design the experiment on the, for the colloquium. So if you get a chance to a complex quaternion Clifford algebra, yep. it's yep. another version of it. You're, you're, the lectures 3 and 4 go into this group structure that, that you were asking about. Does the approach that you've taken enable uh, uh, a simple prediction of the masses of all the elementary particles? Not of all, but you can get somewhere towards those things. Yes. So what about fermions, like the, the electron? Yeah, you can get some. You can get quite a few <coughs> numbers, but but remember that when you do that, you're always doing something that may be a bit more model dependent than you normally use. You can't just get it straight out. So it's not a fundamental theory in that sense. Well, it, it's just that I can't do that. I'm not saying it, it can't. I think it, it can, but okay. I can get some of it that way, but I can't get all of them that way. But eventually I think one can. But I can't. But that's not the same thing as saying it can't. Yes, the way you've described the interaction between the space and dual space, yep. could we could assume that the totality might be described by a non-oriental space such as Klein bottle? Well, you or, can use a Klein bottle. I've used a Klein bottle. Strip. You Mo can use things like that. I've used them. 
Yeah, it's, it's in, in my bigger book, published in 2007. Oh, zero to infinity? Yeah, it, it's in the Klein Bottle Analogies in there. Okay, but it's not in that new book. No, I didn't use it in this. Okay. Because this, this is focused at, you know, what I did in the lectures, which is to say I'm looking for a foundation of physical law. Now, I don't think anybody's going to get every answer out straight away, but eventually, you know, theories do provide, if they're any good, will provide the answers. But, you know, uh, there's, there's things I don't know, so I, I wouldn't know how to, to approach that kind of thing. But I have got quite a few answers, and uh, I've got some predictions which have turned out to be true as well. I'm publishing a book that has that. Yeah. Prediction of all the masses of elementary particles. Right, okay. But it depends what it depends what you've assumed. I assume the force, the electrodynamic yeah. force is the universal force. Yeah. What do uh, symmetrical and asymmetrical um, space have anything to do with Turing in your earlier talk you mentioned? And are the volumes of the two always equal or can they be different? Well they're not the same volume. Because, I mean, when you... The volume. Well, when you say you added the volumes, I mean, they, they're arbitrary. That, that kind of number is arbitrary. There isn't a fixed volume for So anything. it doesn't have a volume? No, because it's, it's non-conserved. It can be anything. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was trying to clarify. Yeah. No connection with Turing? Um, I have got connections with that kind of thing, yes. But, no. but I'm going to be talking more about that on Wednesday. Oh. Uh, sort of computer side of things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But, well, I don't assume any forces or anything. I derive them, but, but you know, derive the concepts rather sure. than assume any concepts. Big picture. Yeah. Before we get lost in the trees. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not trying to do all the uh, non-numerical details, though I do have some. Of them. Thanks again to Peter. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. I can't remember what I did with my sleep. Probably. A little, little black thing. <laughs> oh,